Okay, so we've been talking about the digestive system, and um, this is what's finishing up this unit. On Friday, we discussed different nutrients, and we talked about the four biomolecules, all of that kind of intro into this. Now we're getting into how food is uh, um, digested and absorbed, and then we'll even start talking about the different pathways. But there's two types of digestion in biology or in living organisms. We call it extracellular or intracellular digestion. Intracellular really takes place on a uh, very small scale. Usually organisms that are single-celled, like amoeba, use intracellular digestion because they will engulf their food, and that will be inside of them, and they will digest it inside of their cell. That's intracellular digestion. There's only a few that do that in comparison to all the different animals. You and I digest extracellularly, which means that our food is in our stomach, which is made up of cells, but the cells themselves are not taking the food in. The cells are secreting different acids and enzymes in order to break down the food. So the food is broken down outside of our cells, and then we absorb it. So the majority of organisms that you're familiar with uh, will use extracellular digestion. Intracellular digestion is very small-scale, single-celled, usually organisms, protists, that do that. Um, bacteria. Okay. So, uh, as I mentioned, extracellular digestion is what the majority of organisms do, large organisms, so we consume large foods. We have what we call a gastrovascular cavity. Now, you and I have a gastrovascular cavity, but we give it a little bit more specificity, and we end up calling it our gastrointestinal tract. But again, this is biology, so we're talking about all organisms. A gastrovascular cavity has an opening and an exit, so an entrance and an exit aspect, but they're both the same. So where that organism takes food in, they also release their wastes from. So this really applies to like nadarians, like jellyfish or sea anemones. Um, they all are hydras. They all use an, one opening to bring food in. They kind of break it down and then they release their waste through that same opening. Okay, and um, let me show you what I'm talking about. Here, a very simple body plan. Here's, this is anchored. These tentacles kind of flow and create a current that brings food in. The food is brought down here and broken down. Um, these individual cells will phagocytize it. You can see that they're bringing in the aspects that they need and whatever they're not going to use, they release as waste. So they have one opening that works to bring things in and get rid of waste. You and I have an opening and one that gets rid of waste, but they are not the same. They are not the same. Questions so far? Okay. The alimentary canal is a fancy way of saying your digestive tract. Okay. So you're going to see gastrovascular, gastro anything tells me that I'm dealing with digestion, um, gastrovascular, alimentary, gastrointestinal, these all, thank you, um, these all indicate to us that we're dealing with the digestive tract. So we have an, an opening, our mouth, and we have an exit, our anus. This entire canal is lined with epithelial cells. Do you recall what epithelial cells are? Epithelial cells. It's the skin, yes. So any aspect of your body that's exposed to the environment will be lined in epithelial cells. So why in the world would we line our digestive tract with epithelial cells? Yeah, because the food that we take in is from the environment. Okay, so our entire, from mouth to anus, the entire alimentary canal or gastrointestinal tract is lined with epithelial tissue. Okay, so it mentions that these epithelial tissues, depending on where they are, they synthesize and secrete digestive enzymes, secrete hormones, and also help to di um, transport that material that we've digested and need to get rid of any of the waste will continue to be pushed down. There are... In our alimentary canal, we have sections. 
We have one section, midsection, and a posterior section. And they're each carrying out specific jobs. Um, there may be some slight overlap, but when you say digestion in a complex organism like you and I, the mouth and the stomach do two totally different things. Um, the esophagus, different than the small intestine. So we've got it divided up. Each aspect has its own job that is necessary. The only organ that we really don't need is our large intestine or colon, and we'll get there. Hydrolytic enzymes are used in the digestive system. Hydrolytic tells us what? Water, and, yeah, and lytic tells us that it breaks down. So we're using water to break down things. And the water-based stuff, such as saliva, has water as its main solvent, but multiple enzymes as solutes. And it just depends on that individual and where this is located. But when we talked about stuff on Friday, we start, I said stuff. When we talked about digestion on Friday, we talked about polymers. What's a polymer? Many. So we're eating these really big molecules. And what can we not do with really big molecules? We can break them down, but we can't put them to work immediately. We have to break them down. So we need the polys to all be broken down into monos so that we can actually use them. In order to do that, we're going to have to hydrolyze those chemical bonds. And remember, hydrolyze just means add one water and it breaks that bond. So for every bond we want to break, we just have to add one water. So I want you to be able to distinguish or decipher what this is saying in such a fancy way. But we hydrolyze the chemical bonds in carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids. That's fancy for, we just break them down. That's all that means. And it mentions that some substances that you ingest don't need to be broken down. Like vitamins, they're already in a state where you can just absorb it and they can go straight to work. Okay, so vitamins are already in a very simple state. As far as absorption is concerned, so there's a difference between digestion and absorption. Some aspects are going to be broken down. Some aspects will be take, take, will handle the breaking down of those molecules. And the other aspects will take care of the absorption of actually putting it into your systems. When we absorb any type of nutrient, there are three ways that this is carried out, and we covered these in 1406. There's simple diffusion, which means we're going from high to low, just straight through the cell membrane. High to low, high concentration to low concentration, straight through the cell membrane. There's facilitated diffusion. It says high to low still, but instead of going straight through the cell membrane, what are we going through? Proteins, individual proteins, little channels. Okay, so we're going from high to low, but we have to go through that pathway. How much ATP do those two use? None ATP. Why? They're going with the gradient. It's a natural process. High to low, no energy. On the flip side, active transport goes from low <coughs> to high concentration. And because it's going against its gradient, what does it need? ATP. So the term active tells us that. That was a quick recap of what we discussed in 1406. Okay, um, What the body doesn't absorb and use, guess what it's going to do? It's going to get rid of it, yes. It's going to get rid of it. All right. Now, um, when we say vertebrates, although the majority of this material does specifically apply to humans, there are other animals that are going to be brought in, just even today, and we'll, talk, we'll reference birds, and we'll reference uh, sheep and cow. But the alimentary canal, as I already mentioned, or the gastrointestinal tract, is your digestive system. Your digestive system is composed of your esophagus, your stomach, your small and large intestine. We also have accessory structures, which include like your teeth, your tongue, your gallbladder, your pancreas. Those are not digestive organs. They are accessory structures that aid in digestion. Thank you. That aid in digestion. So um, that's why they're listed here. Also, I don't know, I truly don't know how much you guys know outside of my class science-wise, 
but the pancreas serves for two systems. Digestion, which we're studying now, but also endocrine. So when people say pancreas, immediately they think insulin. Insulin is not for digestion. Insulin is for the endocrine system. So when we talk about pancreas for digestion, we'll talk about it secreting pancreatic juices. That's it. Insulin is not digestive. Insulin is endocrine. Okay, so it's an organ that works as part of two different systems. Now, because vertebrates vary in their anatomy, we have a lot of things in common, but there are some features that some organisms have that others don't, and that's strictly because of their diet and other adaptations. I'm going to mention here in a moment with the bird. Like fish, a stomach, birds having crops and gizzards, whereas we don't have crop, nor do we have a gizzard. So we all carry out similar functions. We have similar anatomy, but are we identical? No. And as I mentioned, it really just depends on that organism and its nutrient requirements and also adaptations that have been successful for it and its species. Here is our digestive system. <coughs> Everything that is considered a digestive organ is in black. Our accessory structures are listed in red or highlighted in red. Uh, it does mention the oral cavity. So the oral cavity is everything up here, and that includes your pharynx, which is the very um, superior portion uh, right above your esophagus. The large intestine is also called the colon. So you'll hear it called colon or large intestine. Mm. Everything else is, you've probably heard these terms before. It's not, there's any foreign terms there. Okay, this is showing you how in our alimentary canal or our gastrointestinal tract, you and I have three regions. We have our in anterior region that's up here at the top. It's responsible for bringing food in. The amount of digestion that occurs there is minimal. It's more of just breaking things down. Okay, so ingestion occurs on the anterior end. The middle portion is food being propelled down and then it makes its way to our stomach where digestion occurs but no absorption occurs. You're going to hear those two terms. Digestion is just breaking it down. Absorption is taking in what our body needs. And the very um, last part, the posterior region of our gastrointestinal tract is used for absorption. So this is the, really the end of our small intestines and into our large intestines. Absorption of nutrients, water. By the time it gets its, uh, made its way to the colon, all the nutrients should be absorbed. The colon is only responsible for reabsorbing or resorbing water. The longer that poop stays in your colon, the more water is absorbed. So the more dehydrated it becomes. The more dehydrated it becomes, the more difficult it is to excrete. And so if it hurts to go to the bathroom, people don't go to the bathroom, and then it continues to dehydrate, and this is why people get constipated. Um, so the colon, as I mentioned, it only really just reclaims water. But that being said, because it only really reclaims water, you can live without it. If you have problems with your colon, it's not going to grossly impair you to have it removed. And all they would do is just take the very end of your small intestine and connect that to your rectum, and that would be it. Your feces would be a little bit more water waterier, watery, they're not so dry. Watery? Yeah, watery. Not so dry. Um, because the large intestine really takes in the rest of that water that's left there. But other than that, all of your nutrient absorption takes place in your small intestine. So as long as you have that, you get the water and the nutrients you need. You might have a slightly modified diet, but you will be just fine. And when people talk about, well, why don't they remove their colon if they have colon cancer? By the time most patients realize they have colon cancer, it's usually stage 3 or stage 4. The problem, we could remove your colon, but what's happened by the time it makes its way to stage 3? It's already starting to metastasize. It's already starting to spread. So um, colon cancer is pretty aggressive. 
And by the time patients realize they have it, it's already spread most of the time. Most of the time. Okay. And we're just going to go through the first portion of uh, the alimentary or digestive system. The mouth. It depends. How much work the mouth does really depends on what the organism eats. If you eat a more herbaceous diet, like you just eat plants, your mouth has to do a whole lot of work. If you are a strict carnivore, your mouth just has to shred that meat and you'll swallow it and that'll be done. You'll also notice that in the event that any of you study animals past this course, Organisms that are herbivores have a very long digestive tract because it takes so long to digest foliage because guess what they can't break down? Cellulose. So they have to spend, that food has to spend a much longer time in there so that little bacteria can help break it down for them. Okay? Now versus the carnivore, Carnivore, a strict carnivore, their intestines and digestive tract is much shorter because they get what they need and they get rid of it. We can break all that down and digest it. So um, the, the, even the whole tract itself differs depending on the diet. You and I are omnivores, and most of us are, and as a result, our digestive tracts are between really short and really long because of that. Okay. Saliva is nothing more than the liquid found in your mouth. When you say that, um, the more time the food spends in your mouth, the more you taste it. Because the more saliva that you mix with it, it kind of makes its way into your taste buds, and that's a whole other lecture. But it gets its way in there. But saliva is not only water-based as the, the solvent, but there's quite a few enzymes in there as well um, that will start to just barely break down polysaccharides. What are polysaccharides? Carbohydrates. Very complex sugars. This is the only thing that starts to be digested in the mouth. Proteins? No. Lipids? No. Nucleic acids? No. The only thing that begins digestion in the mouth are polysaccharides. It also mentions that the saliva could also be used to kill different bacteria that you've ingested. And it may not kill everything. Not a big deal because by the time it makes its way to the stomach, the stomach is, yeah, the stomach's going to take care of it. <coughs> so the pharynx and the esophagus. The pharynx is superior, so it's up here, and then the esophagus is just right below it. It really is a continuous tube. There's no specific division. In anatomy, we just reference areas based on their location, and so we know, okay, well, here's the pharynx and here's the esophagus. The pharynx has three parts, the naso, oro, and then the laryngeopharynx. So it's just about here, and then our esophagus will, will continue from there. And just a pathway, it is a pathway for two systems, though, as well. So right in front of your esophagus, so here's your esophagus, right in front of your esophagus, and many of you have already realized this because you were dealing with your pig, is your trachea. So you were like, oh, where's the esophagus? And we push, and this, you feel that hard. That's the Adam's apple, and that is part of the respiratory system. The pharynx goes in, is part of the respiratory system as well as the digestive system, and they, these two tubes are right back to back to one another with your epiglottis directing, which is going where. So if you're breathing, we cover up your esophagus, and the air goes down your trachea. If you're swallowing, we cover up your trachea, and the food goes down your esophagus. And I believe we've discussed that before, which is why you shouldn't laugh while you eat, because it gets confused, and then you choke. It mentions that swallowing is completely voluntary, and in fact, in order for you to swallow food, you have to create this suction in your mouth. So by closing your lips, it'll create a suction, and it'll force that food down. The little punching bag in the back, the uvula, is there to sense, it's a mechanoreceptor, it senses how much food is there, so it triggers you to want to swallow, so that there's not too much food taken in at once. You take in too much food at once, it causes you to choke, um, or you spit it back out. When you move down from the pharynx, you go to the esophagus, where we have the process of peristalsis. Peristalsis is just muscular contractions that push the food to the stomach. Peristalsis. And they, they're they nice, I'm doing them like this, like they're really, but it's a nice like wave type um, 
contraction, muscular contraction. Here it mentions on our little feathered friend that they have a crop which results from a dilation of the esophagus. What does it mean to dilate something? Make it bigger. So right here we have our esophagus, and right here towards the bottom we have that dilation. Here's the crop. The crop is here holding all the seeds that that bird has. There is some uh, fluid in there that helps to kind of soften those seeds. But look at the size of the stomach in comparison to the crop. So the bird can eat a whole lot, and then it releases a little bit from its crop for its stomach to start to digest. They also have this really unique structure called a gizzard. That gizzard has little pebbles inside of it that help to mechanically break down those seeds. So it's like a little mixing, churning thing as it's, uh, the smooth muscle contracts and starts to help rub down those seeds. Okay, so it mentions that there, um, this digestive tract is unique to their diet. <coughs> it also, not only do they have that adaptation, but their bones are all hollow. They have no bone marrow. Why is it beneficial for them to have hollow bones? So that they are lighter and can fly. We also know that their respiration, which we don't cover respiration this semester, but when they breathe, if they're flying, their air goes in through their nose and out through their cloaca. Why don't they breathe out through their nose when they're flying? It's really difficult, yes. When you're flying and air is being pushed in your face, it's very difficult to exhale or expire, but not die. But expiration is exhaling. So um, these are just small adaptations that these unique animals have so that they can better fit in their environment. Stomach for you and I is a, an organ that is composed of smooth muscle. The best thing about smooth muscle is that it can grow. The worst thing about smooth muscle is that it can grow. Why is that such a bad thing for your stomach? Yeah, some of you like to really eat a lot. And when you eat a lot, it stretches your stomach, and your stomach doesn't say, oh, I can't handle it anymore. It says, no worries, I'll get bigger. <laughs> and then, because it gets bigger, when you eat the next time, guess what it tells you? I'm still not full. And so you eat more, and it's kind of like a perpetuating issue. And that same notion, because it's muscle, if you don't use it, you lose it. So people do go through stomach shrinking and they can uh, eat less food, and it's a mental type self-control thing, and it will slowly start to shrink their stomach so that when they eat small meals, they feel full. Okay, it mentions that the stomach, I already said this is muscular in nature, but that helps it to break down food mechanically. The stomach is constantly flexing when you're digesting <coughs> to help manipulate the food in there. We're also adding in some acids, hydrochloric acid, pepsinogen, secretions from chief cells, a lot of things that you don't necessarily need to know because that's all anatomy. But the environment inside our stomach is a pH of around 2. With that being said, if we took what was in our stomach and put that on our skin right now, it would burn right through. Like, no questions asked. Why doesn't it burn through our stomach? Because we secrete mucus inside our stomach that protects the walls of our stomach. And those of you who have, have had or have known someone who has had ulcers, Ulcers eat through that, and then they are burning your stomach away. And that's, of course, very uncomfortable. And so you try to neutralize the acidity of your stomach. I'm going to come down here, and I'm going to come back to this. In your stomach, because of the acidity, it denatures proteins. So proteins are digested in the stomach. There's no lipid or carbohydrate digestion that occurs in the stomach. When food is in the stomach, as it's been there for a while, it is reduced to a chyme content. Chyme is a liquid mush. I think it looks like clam chowder because it's like soupy and lumpy at the same time. And it will continue to be pushed back and forth. And slowly, you will release a little bit of it to your small intestine. And I, I want to reiterate slowly. In small little spurts, of around three to four milliliters, you'll release into your small intestine. And that's super acidic, so immediately we have to buffer it with uh, bile and pancreatic juices from your pancreas that will come in and neutralize that and take it from being two to an eight, as far as pH is concerned, in just a few minutes. 
small amounts, small amounts are released <coughs> so that it's not overwhelmed. In the event that you do overwhelm, you do release too much, it can't handle that, so it just slides right down and you have diarrhea, which is 100% why diarrhea burns, because diarrhea hasn't had the opportunity to be neutralized, so that acidity is just sliding right down. And that's, of course, not healthy for those cells either, which is why it hurts to go to the bathroom. And then even after whatever's caused that diarrhea has gone, you still have to catch up after a couple of days because those cells have to replace themselves and they've been damaged. Herbivore stomachs are much longer and more complex. They have to digest cellulose because all they eat are plants but they lack that enzyme cellulase, so they rely on small bacteria to take care of that for them. We see that these organisms have ruminants, so they have different areas, different compartments within this stomach-type cavity. So the rumen, the reticulum, the omasum, and the abomasum. What we'll notice in these organisms, and um, sheep, cow, any grazers really, is that they chew and then they swallow. And it goes to one stomach, and it sits there for a little bit, and then it burps and regurgitates it and chews it again. And then it swallows and it goes to the next stomach. And this is a process that continues until the food is ready to make its way to the intestine. Um, this is why these organisms constantly look like they're chewing. Like you, they haven't eaten a piece of grass off the ground in an hour, but they just keep chewing. It's because they keep regurgitating and rechewing their food. At that point, we don't technically call it food. It's referenced as cud, which is just all of that mixed in with their digestive enzymes. Okay, so here's kind of showing you how that works. So it'll swallow, it'll come, and then it'll get regurgitated. It'll come back, and it'll make its way through until eventually it gets its way to the intestines, and then out. It spends a whole lot of time being broken down. That's a really large area. We also notice that these organisms um, a lot of times become very gassy. Why? They have a lot of bacteria in there. And when bacteria break down that cellulose for them, which is beneficial, their bacteria waste products is gas. And so these organisms will fart quite a bit. Okay. And this is where we're stopping, right? Yes, the methane release from these agricultural